We shouldn't say they're exactly banned. Prohibition has hardly gotten humankind anywhere. And just like the war on drugs, war on poverty, and war on terrorism, these anti-government funded projects have normally had the opposite reaction. So when it comes to these engines, they're simply not used because they aren't exactly profitable or practical yet. In this video, you'll learn why various unorthodox engines exist, yet are not mainstream today. That's your cue to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell for future uploads. Water-Powered Engines In Tokyo, a Japanese company invented an electric-powered and environmentally friendly car that runs solely on water. Genepax unveiled the car in Osaka and claimed that a liter or just 2.1 pints of any kind of water, rather it be fresh or salt water, was all that's necessary to get the engine roaring for almost an hour, and assured that their vehicle could sustain a speed of 80 kilometers per hour, which is just about 50 miles per hour. Isn't that mind-boggling? Genepax's CEO, Kiyoshi Hirasawa, went on to tell TV Tokyo, quote, The car will continue to run as long as you have a bottle of water to top up from time to time. It does not require you to build an infrastructure to recharge your battery, which is usually the case for most electric cars." End quote. The Genepak CEO went on to explain that when the water is poured into the tank in the back of the car, then a generator breaks it down and uses it to create electrical power. The next step was for Genepaks to apply for a patent and try to do some collaborations with other Japanese auto manufacturers. The problem remains because most big automakers working on fuel cell cars that run on hydrogen and emit water rather than consume water. But just in case you are unaware, let's explain what the Water Energy System, or WES, actually is. To make a long story short, it's a fuel cell that converts hydrogen and oxygen back into electricity, which is used to run to a motor to power the car. Fuel cell technology is well understood and pretty efficient at changing hydrogen and oxygen into electricity and water except the hydrogen came from water in the first place. Chemically, it's locked up in the atom bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms. When the hydrogen and oxygen combine, whether it's in a fuel cell, internal combustion engine running on hydrogen, or a jury-rigged pickup truck with an electrocyst cell in the bed, there's energy left over in the form of heat or electrons that's converted to mechanical energy by the pistons and crankshaft or electric motors. But here's the other hiccup. It takes exactly the same amount of energy to pry those hydrogen and oxygen atoms apart inside the electrosis cell as you get back when they recombine inside the fuel cell. Air Cars We call them air cars, but they don't fly nor hover. According to Matthew Janser's report for Popular Science in 2014, for more than a century, air cars have remained a quest of engineers. Although the science is there for our benefit, the likelihood of it being produced on a large scale is far-fetched. As fuels go, air has obvious upsides. It's ubiquitous, clean, and best of all, it's free. But outside energy is needed to complement the energy that comes from air, since it must be compressed. This limits the utility of an all-air car, which is a total bummer. In 2010, two brilliant engineers from French automaker PSA Peugeot Citroën thought they could overcome that problem by pairing two tried-and-true technologies, a gasoline engine and hydraulics. To test the concept, they formed the hybrid air program and connected the engine of a subcompact car to a commercial airplane's hydraulic system. Yars, one of the engineers, explained that during normal drive, the system will switch between gas and air power. Much like with hybrid electric vehicles, the gasoline engine of the air car provides a boost up steep hills, and during other times, torque is essential, like on the highway. Then it repressurizes the nitrogen tank if the regenerative braking system hasn't already done so. So the breakdown, according to Yars, is that for urban driving, which will account for less than 43 miles per hour, between 60 and 80 percent of drive time will be under air power alone, so it's still beneficial. When compared to gasoline electrics, the hybrid air powertrain is lighter and cheaper, and there's no bulky batteries that wear out or decrease space for the passengers and driver. Yars is quoted saying, the system is designed to live for the life of the vehicle, and the only possible maintenance will be an air recharge." End quote. The hybrid car uses compressed nitrogen, which is held in a tank called the high-pressure accumulator. Then a hydraulic pump and piston compresses nitrogen in the accumulator. When the nitrogen is released by simply pressing the accelerator, the pump runs in reverse. Now it's become a motor that harnesses the energy of the moving hydraulic fluid to send power to the wheels. After the hydraulic fluid passes through the motor, it flows to the low-pressure accumulator, where it is stored for later use. And for supplements, a gasoline engine can give it that extra boost to rock and roll off-road and up hills. Magnet Motors Think of the push and pull of magnetism, including that no-friction phenomenon it produces. 
The goal of a magnet motor is to employ only permanent magnets to attract and repel forces in sequence, which produces a steady continued motion, like a conventional electric motor, without reversing polarity or using an external power source. Human ingenuity has been able to create maglev, or magnetic levitation, which could pull a train along to speeds that outrun bullet trains. It seems that like our Earth using magnetism to protect its atmosphere, humans will be able to harness this force and accomplish magnificent speeds. So yes, magnets can actually be very powerful. Rare Earth magnets containing lanthanide elements, such as neodymium and cerium, carry large magnetic moments. For example, a neodymium magnet comprised of neodymium, iron, and boron, and measuring only 10.16 centimeters, has a pull force of 557 kilograms, or 1,227 pounds. Plus, it is stable even at 176 degrees Fahrenheit if not damaged. Moreover, the magnet will only lose less than 1% of its strength over a duration of a decade. The problem with this magnetic method is that the magnets must repeatedly be pulled apart. This amount of work or mechanical energy required to pull the magnets apart is similar to the amount of mechanical energy the magnets generated when they pulled themselves together. Accordingly, permanent magnets are unable to work continuously on their own without an external source of mechanical energy to repeatedly pull them apart. So, the devastating truth causes frowns. An external force must be applied to separate two permanent magnets that have pulled themselves together with their attractive force. So we're more than likely back at square one with another hybrid to be the missing link. Until now, engineers have not observed two permanent magnets attract and repel themselves in sequence unaided. This sequence of attraction followed by repulsion is like the attract-repel sequence that occurs in an electric motor between permanent magnet and an electromagnet. So the bottom line is, magnet motors, air compressed motors, and engines that run on water have not added greater value compared to electric motor nor gasoline guzzlers. In all these cars, they still need to rely on a supplemental power source. Therefore, if they're not a hybrid, they won't be useful, even for the short term. So what are your thoughts about these interesting engines? Sound off in the comment section below, then give this video a thumbs up if you learned something, subscribe, and ring the notification bell for future uploads. Until next time!